we've got Rob Myers here. Uh, Rob hey. has been a professional developer since eight or not 1896, 1986. Um, <laughs> and he's been training and coaching Agile teams since 1998. His mission at Agile Institute is to help teams create worthwhile software within sane workplaces. By the way, look for Rob's upcoming book, Essential Test Driven Development, which is due later this year or early 2022. And with that, I will stop sharing and Rob will turn it over to you. Thanks very much. Okay, I am going to share a Miro screen. I'm going to try to share a Miro screen. There we go. Uh, let's see. Okay, well, let's get right into it here. Um, although that's not doing what I thought it would do. There we go. So, um, there's this thing that happens on a lot of scrum teams. They, uh, it happens to Greenfield scrum teams and it happens to scrum teams that ha are working on a product that is already existing. Um, but I suppose it's probably happens more quickly on a scrum team that's working on, a, on an existing product. But it even happens on uh, uh, some of the greenfield uh, projects that I've I've seen and uh, that I've coached, and what happens is uh, they start with no code. You know, let's let's start over. Let's write this from scratch. Whatever it is, and uh, their first few sprints are pretty easy, pretty straightforward. They're able to build a thin slice of software, the UI, and all the way to the database and back again. And you know everybody's pretty happy, and this is uh, you know a unique situation for them. Scrum is new and fresh and, and kind of exciting, uh, and uh, things are progressing along. Second sprint. Oh, this is not doing what I thought it was going to do. Okay, I'll just do this manually. You'd think by now I'd be an expert at Miro, but uh, Miro tricks me every time. So. All right, so a couple sprints later, there's a little bit of complexity happening with the software, but everybody's still pretty happy. Uh, and this is not like one sprint. This is, you know, maybe three or four sprints. And then, oops. Things start to happen. Stuff starts to slow down after about, it seems like about the fifth or sixth sprint um, into a project. And that seems to be the case whether or not the sprints are uh, one week long or four weeks long. They, uh, things just seem to start to happen. Maybe somebody introduces a defect and uh, they're a little bit upset because they hadn't expected that defect. You know, nobody ever does expect a defect, right? Uh, After a while, whoops. Yeah. <laughs> Come on, Miro, cooperate. After a while, things are starting to feel a lot less happy and fun. Uh, what's happening is that we are uh, we are developing software, and we're trying to do it in thin slices from end to end. And what happens with software is that it doesn't it doesn't lend itself really to uh, continuous thin slices because we don't build. I don't know if you can see me, but uh, they don't they don't really get built this way in straight vertical slices. They tend to cross cut across each other. In fact, especially at the beginning of a project, the uh, the most critical, most important subsystems in the software are the things that change the most frequently. For example, if you are, uh, if you have a database schema, you might find that your schema is changing every sprint, right? Oh, we needed this new field. We forgot about this table, or we just have a join that we need to add in. Whatever it is, that's the kind of thing where the, the more important it is, the more it changes at the beginning. And so these people are running into this situation where what they thought would take a single sprint 
uh, it, they're not able to get those, those PBIs, those product backlog items or user stories uh, done. And so everybody, including the product owner and the scrum master and all the developers and testers are, are unhappy. And it's not just the, the, the coders that are experiencing this, you know, they're, they're finding that it's more difficult and more difficult to add to their own software, but the testers are also uh, running into the same situation because what they're realizing is that in the beginning, in the first sprint, it was easy to test all of the PBIs. Um, when you get to the fifth sprint, you don't just test the PBIs from the fifth sprint, you have to test all of them from the very beginning of time. So uh, that's a lot of effort because you have to make sure that everything is still working, okay? So this is what I call the Agilist's dilemma. Come down here, do it manually. The Agilist's dilemma is this uh, experience of suffering because we are doing what's agile, right? We're, we're doing the incremental and iterative development but something seems to be wrong. It's slowing down. Uh, our throughput is slowing down. So product is not happy. Uh, software developers are running into more defects. Uh, so they're not happy. Testers are, are having to work overtime and weekends. So nobody's happy. And uh, we presumably know that agile is a good thing. It's better than waterfall. It's, you know, it's adaptive. It's, it's adapting to market demands. It's, a, it's fast feedback, et cetera, et cetera. What we haven't done in a Scrum environment, and Scrum, this is not a, a fault of Scrums. Scrum was designed to, uh, a, a, the original Scrum teams actually went off for a month and worked on their software and then presented what they had built on uh, at the end of the month. And that was the original, those were the original Scrum teams. Um, but what they did in that month was never specified by Scrum. That's not its purpose. That's not, it's not designed to do that. Um, so that there's a gap there. There's a gap of information as to what are we supposed to do? We've got an iterative and incremental approach uh, from, from the external standpoint, but we're not doing anything differently from an internal standpoint. And this is why you see, if, you've, if you're on a Scrum team, you might have these things called testing sprints. That's not Scrum, right? Or a design sprint, not Scrum. That's a waterfall, right? And even within a sprint, you'll see teams that are doing this kind of thing where uh, they're pushing all of their testing to the end of the sprint. So let's hurry up and test this, okay? You know, let's, let's work until the day before the end of the sprint on coding and then, you know, throw it over the, the shorter wall to testers and have the testers cram in, you know, and I've, I've seen teams where the testers are having to work uh, all night long to test the software you know, until like three in the morning testing the software. And then they come in bedraggled and tired and, you know, they've opened up uh, uh, a dozen new severity one defects. And guess what gets done? Nothing. How many PBIs are completed? Zero, right? So this is just not working. The problem is that we need to do something different, right? We need to be having, I'm gonna uh, do this slowly so that nobody gets seasick. We need to be having some new practices, some software development practices that are also iterative and incremental in nature. And so that's the core four. So I'm gonna talk a little bit, I'm gonna assume that nobody, uh, or that some of you have never even heard of some of these things. So I'll describe them in brief uh, and then we'll move on from there. So uh, TDD or BDD is test-driven development uh, or behavior-driven development. Uh, or both. And uh, they're very similar. They're test first approaches where we essentially write the test first or what we're, what we're seeing now or what we're kind of, it's realizing that the, the word test isn't quite right. It's a test once it passes, but it's something even just as important before it passes. It's a specification or it's a scenario, right? We're describing what we expect the software to do. And we're describing it not like all up front and then expecting the team to, to meet those tests and make those tests pass, we're doing it one at a time. Uh, if, there's, uh, if there's a whole team doing it one at a time, that's possible. Or you know, if you've got four developers, you might be doing two at a time, okay? 
So that approach is a, a very powerful approach because you're making an investment in the behaviors in an automate, you know, you're having building an automated specification basically, so that once it starts passing, it's locking in that that investment in your software behavior. Okay, uh, the difference between test-driven development, behavior-driven development, TDD is more uh, developer-facing. Uh, it's usually written in the programming language uh, that they're using to build stuff, and behavior-driven development is more product-facing, more outward customer-facing and uh, people are usually using something like Cucumber where they can specify things in a, uh, uh, a, re a more you know, human, or sorry guys, the developers, you're humans too, and I'm a developer, so I know that we're all humans, but we're special. So uh, uh, it's, it's more readable to a larger majority of, of people. Um, and uh, it doesn't require a software developer to write them. That's the advantage there. So that's, test-driven development or behavior-driven development. Uh, refactoring is not rewriting and it's not uh, correcting mistakes. It's not, uh, you know, we're gonna build things sloppy and then make it clean. It's actually making, my, my, my clearest definition is it's making any change to the system that improves maintainability and extensibility, okay? and readability. So it's changing the software so that the software is more changeable effectively. Um, we do this on a, on a daily, hourly, minute by minute basis uh, in order to keep things cleaned up. So we're always cleaning clean code effectively. And uh, the advantages of that is that we then don't have a big pile of things that need to change. Continuous integration, this is a, a really critical uh, practice for a team of, of uh, more than you know, one or two people uh, because they're presumably working in parallel on different activities and they need to be communicating those changes to each other, okay? Uh, and so this is effectively what we call also trunk-based development where what we're doing is we have one uh, one document of record, one repository of record. We don't have long-lived branches. And what I mean by long-lived is I consider a branch that lives longer than a day to be too long, okay? So we're actually, uh, generally speaking, on the teams that I worked on, we do continuous integration. We integrate to the trunk uh, once every couple of hours, preferably. And that's everybody. So uh, sometimes we can see eight or nine uh, integrations per day. And then uh, the last one, there is pair programming or mob programming. Um, I'll describe that in a little more detail in a moment, but it's also now known as ensemble programming. The, uh, uh, our, our European friends decided that the word mob was, was uh, not a comfortable word. And uh, so that tends to be changing it's hard to change the names of things. I mean, I'd love to change test-driven development to something else, but, uh, and I talked to Kent Beck about that once many, 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 many years ago. And he just said, you know, hey, that train has left the station. So it's really hard to change the names of things once they have this. So we might be stuck with mob programming, but effectively mob programming is not that chaotic. It's actually a kind of a, an adaptation of pair programming. There's still a pair there. There's one person with their fingers on the keyboard. There's another person sitting next to them, maybe keeping track of the to-do list and the larger picture. And then there's the rest of the team that's available for uh, conversations, especially with the navigator. Um, and uh, they're having, uh, you know, they're, they're communicating their needs. So we have product represented there. We have testers, we have BAs, we have developers, we have whoever's necessary to uh, work on a particular task sitting there all at one computer with one big screen, or in, in some cases, two really big screens. I've seen some great uh, mob setups that are, that are you know, these big, huge uh, LED screens, and they've got two of them, and they've got the code over here, and they've got the, you know, whatever Jira or whatever they, they need over on the other side. And, uh, and, and they have two keyboards so they can switch very quickly. They're not typing at the same time, but they're switching very, very rapidly just by saying, you know, hey, 
now you go. And then that person can get up and casually rejoin the mob and they'll just rotate that way. So pair programming is again also uh, included in that and pair programming is not one person watching over the shoulder of the other. It's two people actually actively engaged in doing a task. Um, think about it, you know, in terms of a pilot navigator of, a, of an airplane or, you know, a surgeon and an assistant surgeon. These are, these are uh, roles that can switch back and forth very quickly. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm very strongly uh, encouraging people to not think about it as junior, senior, because um, I've been pairing with people at times that were fresh out of college and they, you know, taught me a thing or two. Uh, very important things. In fact, I've got a great story I can I can share with you uh, uh, later. But but I want to get back to uh, uh, these core four. And I have a question for you all. I'm going to bring up the chat window. So uh, don't hit enter yet. But I'd like you to vote on one of these four. Tell me which one you think. I would put in the middle, or you can vote on which one you would want to see in the middle. Uh, and what I mean by the middle, they're really, you know, in a way, they're th these are all interrelated. So they're they're in one way you could see say that there isn't a middle. You know, if you think of this as a three dimensional pyramid kind of uh, shape here, you could rotate it any direction, and uh, there is no middle, right? Um, but from the standpoint of resolving the Agilist dilemma, that suffering that's being caused because we're changing things so quickly, what is it, what is the thing that needs to happen the most? Okay, or is the is sort of the center of attention here? And go ahead and hit return here. You see lots of votes for CI, a couple votes for continuous integration. PD, pairing mobbing. Is that everybody? Bueller. Okay. Last chance. Okay. What's neat is that you're all right, right? Because there is no center. Um, <laughs> but uh, surprisingly, nobody voted for factoring. I kind of see this as the center, the core, the, the chewy center, because this is the thing that allows us to uh, keep the design so that it's changeable and so that we can adapt to changing requirements, new requirements, uh, small requirements. This is the thing that keeps the software soft so that, so that we can add new stuff. In fact, there's techniques that you can use to sort of reshape your code with the anticipation of what you're about ready to add two minutes later. Or you can just add it and then reshape it so that it looks like it's been there all along. So refactoring is kind of the core, for me anyway, of how you keep the technical debt of your software design, the, the changeability of your software design. Since I started saying it two different ways, I'll just say the, the changeability being the good thing, the technical debt's the bad thing. The, the changeability, high. Right, so that you can continue sprint after sprint after sprint, knowing that you have a way of making changes to your design without breaking anything. Now, of course, you can't really, well, in most cases, it's much, much easier to uh, do refactoring if you have test-driven development in place because that's providing the safety net around your refactorings. You know that your refactoring, which is any change to the, to the uh, maintainability and extensibility of the code that does not change the behavior, you know that you haven't changed the behavior because you have these automated tests that run super duper fast, okay? So test-driven development, even though it's the topic of the book that I'm writing, you would think, hey, you know, Rob's all about TDD. Uh, it's actually somewhat secondary, and I promise you the book will say that, it will admit to it. But the thing is, is that this is the practice that provides the safety net. So test-driven development is actually the activity that these uh, uh, agile 
teams that I worked on, extreme programming teams, were doing pretty much all day long. That was what they did. The majority of their time was they would sit down together and they would do test-driven development, uh, which includes refactoring as a, as a step, in fact, okay? Uh, and then, of course, the others are also supporting this. If you, uh, if you don't have continuous integration and you have multiple uh, branches out there that you're refactoring on, uh, it becomes really more challenging. Let's imagine that, uh, you know, uh, uh, three of you are working on one change and another three are working on another change. And these chains are dramatically different, but they're in the same area of the code. And then you go to merge three weeks later and all of your refactorings are, are for naught. And the whole point of refactoring is to make things, you're communicating with the rest of the team, you're making things easier for the rest of the team to change things. So you want to get those refactorings in uh, as quickly as possible. Okay, and then pairing or mobbing. Uh, this is, the funny thing is, the best way to describe how pairing and mobbing relate to refactoring is to describe what happens when you don't pair because, you know, after whatever 35 years of programming, that's just professionally. I was also, you know, writing code since I was a wee child. Um, when I work alone, I write stuff that, that I know I can read. And I bet every single one of you would read that code and go, what is he even talking about? It's just a disaster. It's like I write crap without somebody else sitting next to me. And the great thing about at least having one other person sitting with me is that that person will let me know, you know that, that uh, uh, they don't understand something I just wrote. And that is powerful enough to make things uh, changeable and readable. And I just noticed something. We, very few people are actually using their camera. Why are we not using our camera here? I want to see faces. Some of you are probably on phones. Hey, if you have a camera, turn it on. There we go. Thank you. <laughs> eating. Yes, <laughs> two people eating. If you're eating, don't turn on your camera, please. Okay. <laughs> I just felt a little bit alone. I, I, I had this course I was teaching once uh, for a team um in that are like they have to be very secure so their their laptops literally have no camera i'd rather see you chewing than not see you at all um and it was it was really weird i felt like i was talking to uh you know outer space thank you okay that's a, that's plenty you know as long as i have a couple of faces that you know when when i say when i tell a stupid joke they roll their eyes uh i can tell that it's a stupid joke right so uh a couple other things about this, this diagram that you're looking at here is that you'll see that there are these gray arrows between the others too. So they're all interconnected. Um, uh, Test-driven development and continuous integration. You know, continuous integration, if you have like a, a, a build server, the build server should also be running all the tests. And if a single test that used to pass is now failing, that should uh, break the build and basically your changes don't get in, right? Uh, for the longest time, people could break the build and then go home. And uh, uh, that, was a, that was a very, very bad thing. So nowadays with the latest tools, you break the build and your changes get kicked out. You know, it's like, hey, go fix your changes because you broke the build. So you break it, you buy it. No, you, you break it and it gets unbroken. Um, TDD and pairing, I can't even separate those two. I'm, I'm tempted to make that like a really solid line. I, I can't imagine doing test-driven development without somebody sitting next to me uh, and vice versa. It's just, it's, it's a very collaborative sort of activity there. Uh, they're also working with you on the tests. And sometimes, you know, when you're in the code and you're trying to write a test and you're like, well, I don't know what test to write. The person with the other perspective, the more broad perspective, the other, the navigator can say, hey, well, let's, let's, we got these three scenarios to test. Let's pick the easiest one and let's go. Okay. So it's, it's somebody to bounce ideas off of. It's somebody to do a little research on another keyboard, you know, another computer if they need to, you know, to ch check out slash dot, whatever it is, uh, 
copy and paste. No, just kidding. Um, so there's these interrelated kind of uh, activities there. Um, and uh, that, that pretty much, I think that pretty much, whoops. Meow. Oh, now I'm gonna make people sick. Oh yeah, and then I end this by just telling you that uh, if we don't get to all your questions, you can always contact me and uh, I, will, I will get back to you. Um, I'm looking at five straight weeks of training, so I will get back to you in two months, but I will get back to you. <laughs> and uh, I'm ready for us to have questions. I don't know how you usually do that. Do you throw them in chat or do you just sort of raise your hand, raise your, your pseudo hand? Uh, whatever you would prefer. The, I think the cool thing about uh, the hand raising idea, is, by the way, can people see me still, even yes. though I'm sharing my screen? Okay, okay, good. So when I was doing this, the thin slices, you could actually see me doing the thin slices, even though I think I started in the wrong side and went the wrong way, but anyway. Okay, um, I would say if you, if you go to the uh, control panel there and the responses, which look different from me because I'm sharing my screen. But if you use the raise hand, if you have it, I, I've found that some people don't even have it. The neat thing is that you will get moved over to the upper left of my screen. And so I know you have a question. If not, mm, you can use chat as well. There we go. So uh, Jana, Jana. Yeah. Um, so I'm wondering how you justify that, that cost of refactoring, pair programming, you know, I, I tend to come across this as a wall all the time, right? Um, I know people buy into it uh, as far as refactoring in theory, right? right. But the, the, then they go through that cost benefit analysis, right? And then it's like, no, you know, or for the short term cost benefit analysis. So those kind of things, I'm like, how do you, I haven't gotten over that hump yet. So how do you get over that particular hump with the cost benefit justification. Yeah, and I, I guess I, I'm interested in, are you getting this more from leadership or from developers or both? Leadership for refactoring, um, developers for that pair mob programming, they tend to like to be isolated, do their thing, focus, that interactive causes stress for them, right? right? And so different audiences, I guess, but those are two hurdles that I do see. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about, uh, I'll try to address, I've got three things to say about both of those audiences. So, so let me see if I can remember all three of them as I go. Um, as far as the developers go, uh, I find that, that one of the things that really helps them to, to uh, absorb these things and see whether they can tolerate it or not is uh, we have sprints. We have these two week periods of time where we can try anything and we can try it in a way that is, uh, it's safe because we'll say, well, we're, let's try pairing for, or let's try mobbing for a sprint as though we really meant it, right? You know, so, so don't, don't go, oh, I don't like pairing, so I'm not gonna pair. I don't like pairing, but I'll try it, right? And then at the retrospective, kind of go back and go, well, was this more valuable or less valuable than working alone? And um, I, you know, when I first started out in, in 98 on my first extreme programming project, I'm the one who said, I have two hemispheres and so I don't need to pair. I've already got two brains, right? So I'm already getting two perspectives, leave me alone. Um, I gotta tell you, I was wrong. It's, and, and I'm an introvert, I'm a horrible introvert and so all of these, you know, I'm an introvert, I work better alone, I want to put my headphones on, blah, 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 leave me alone. It's interesting because when you actually start working with somebody, uh, it, it's, it's a lot of fun. And you, this is another person who's usually, you know, a nerd. And so you can, you, can, you don't have to focus entirely on coding. You can, you know, throw out, hey, did you see the, the latest science fiction movie, blah, blah, blah. And it's very it's, it's a, a very enjoyable situation. Um, and it's also, it adds uh, a layer of courage to 
the team because if I'm sitting there alone and I find that I don't know something and I have a little bit of this imposter syndrome, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go and read Slashdot and read up on this thing and maybe take a little online course, uh, watch some YouTube videos and try to figure it out myself. And if, I, if I'm sitting next to somebody and they don't know how to do it too, that gives me a higher level of confidence that this is a difficult thing. And we're both going to watch those YouTube videos and we're both going to get something different out of it. And so this, this radical idea of radical collaboration is actually kind of, uh, it's, it's very educational. I have learned more from pairing with people than, than four years of college. No, no issue there. And just pairing with people in like, you know, a six month project. And I learned more than I learned in all my years of college. So it's, it's definitely uh, um, beneficial to the software developers. And that's the key to getting software developers to try something is to give them an inkling of what it, what's in it for them. <clears throat> okay, if they don't see any value for them, you know, they're not gonna do it. They're, they're you know, altruistic, I'm getting a paycheck, blah, blah, blah. No, they're gonna, they're gonna shortcut it. But if they can feel that this is actually providing some value to them on a personal level, like, you know, I'm, I'm learning stuff, I'm, I'm having more fun, uh, you know, we're, we're, every once in a while we geek out about something off topic and that may seem like a waste, but it's not because we're so focused. You know, if, if I go on a break and I'm off reading my Facebook and three hours go by and I'm like, oh shit, I was supposed to be, uh, sorry, oh shoot, I was supposed to be working, <laughs> right, sorry. That was supposed to get filtered by the good place filter. So it was supposed to come out, oh shirt. Um, <laughs> You know, it, 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 if I'm pairing with somebody and we said, we're going to take a 10 minute break, I got to come back in 10 minutes. And there's no, there's, there's somebody holding me accountable to that. The, the leadership thing is a little bit different because um, my, my feeling is that we wouldn't be talking about these practices if they weren't, um, if the return on investment weren't higher than the cost. And so there's this assumption that having two people do the work of one kind of thing, right? Mm -hmm. Or the assumption that refactoring is rewriting is, um, is a cost. And why would we do that? That would be dumb. So, so what we have to also realize at that level is that it's not, it, it, it's not even a long-term benefit that we're getting. We get short-term benefits out of all of these things. Uh, pair programming has been shown to be, you know, uh, pretty much 80% reduction in, in defects. And, uh, uh, you know, that, that you could, you could argue, I suppose that, you know, that's not that big a deal, but every defect is not only costly in, you know, revenue directly, but it's also costly because it goes back through the, the, the value stream and has to be reworked. So it's basically work that, that we thought was done, but isn't. That's what every single defect is. It's a, it's a piece of work that we thought was done, but isn't, so needs to be done again. That's waste. So if you reduce that waste, you're gonna benefit. I had one, uh, a guy in a, a test-driven development course way back, and he was very skeptical of test-driven development pair programming and the whole thing. And then at, at, at his lunch hour, he spent his lunch hour uh, in the debugger. And I'm like, so how much of your, uh, your time do you find that you have to spend in the debugger looking for defects? And he's like, oh, 50% of my time. I'm like, well, how about if we talked about ways to get that 50% back? On the software projects that I worked on where we were doing test-driven development for six months or more, we would have maybe one showstopper defect per month. Yeah. Okay, so we stopped, we stopped even tracking the number of defects we had. And we started tracking how long the, the defect or two that we had were, were lasting. How long was it taking us to find them? Uh, and, and so serious defects, they just stopped. Um, so that's, that's pairing, refactoring. Refactoring is just, it's, it's kind of like, I like to describe it like this. Um, if you're the if you're a chef and you're preparing a uh, you know a four star meal at a at a four star restaurant, and uh, you discover that one of your knives is dull, you have two choices. You could just continue cutting those carrots with the dull knife, risking your fingers, and risking getting you know 
chunky misshapen carrots and a little bit of blood into your dish. Or you could spend the time to sharpen the knife and then slice clean, you know, evenly cooked carrots. And it's the old, you know, uh, how long am I going to spend sharpening the axe to cut down the tree? But I don't like to cut down trees. So, so I like to use the chef's knives uh, uh, analogy there, right? We have to take the time to do the professional right, correct thing because it's, it improves our throughput. And that's the, that's the thing that, that, that I'm kind of trying to get at is that each one of these actually has improves throughput, improves the, the flow of value. Uh, and, and so the cost, if you're just looking at cost, you're just looking at one side of the equation. It feels like you're not dedicated to reducing silos if you don't have at least some pair programming because then you're not transferring knowledge between teams or between members. Um, feels like that to me, too. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's the, 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 the energy that you get from collaborating, whether it's pairing, uh, whether it's, you know, uh, mobbing, ensemble, um, it's, you have so many fewer meetings, you have so many fewer uh, disagreements, you know, or misunderstandings about everything. And everybody gets educated on everything that's going on around them. I had one uh, mob team that decided at one, some point that they were going to reduce the amount of time that they spent at, with one person at the keyboard down to a minute, a single minute. And they said, okay, so it seemed chaotic at first, but then what we realized was everybody had to, they had a team of five. Everybody had to stay focused because five minutes later, you were going to be at the keyboard. So nobody ever like drifted off into la la land. Okay, so anyway, I hope that helped. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Smita, you've been waiting a long time. Thank you, Rob. Um, so I have a question regarding uh, the mock programming itself. Um, so in the situation that I was in as a Scrum Master, um, we decided ourselves as a team, the front end and the back end team together to have the uh, the swarm the, the mob programming sessions and initially they were all on board and we had good sessions um i want to say it, it, it would be once a week and would be for two three hours and we had good sessions for two weeks and then uh, gradually i saw you know uh, decline in the invitations and people would not come uh, to the more programming sessions. So how do you suggest as a scrum master influencing the team to, uh, to you know, do the knowledge to come to the sessions, more programming sessions and have that knowledge sharing session. And, you know, also acknowledging that not everybody is at the same level of understanding. And some people tend to think that they are only giving and not receiving. So it's a waste of their time. While I don't think that should be the case in the, in the more programming sessions within the teams, because we are together, we are uplifting everyone and with the knowledge sharing. And that's what it means to be, you know, to get to the high performing team. Um, what, what were they doing when they weren't mobbing? Well, they, they were um, just working, they, they mentioned they are just working on their own um, PBI. Um, so it was sort of like an experiment that they were doing. What's that? It was kind of an experiment that they were running as far as the mobbing hour or two per week. Uh, I would say so because we emphasized on it and we thought it will be a good way to go. So we started doing it. Uh, so you can say kind of an experiment. We started doing it and we saw a lot of, uh, we, we knocked a lot of blockers um, in, in those sessions. And we were very, because oftentimes after the two week sprint, we would see some of the stories not done. While when we started doing the mock programming, we, we would see the blockers, you know, it's just going away from the, from the block section of the Jira board, uh, which was which was nice, and we were very uh, optimistic about this approach. Uh, so, with the along with the leadership, but 
um, the, hmm. the team was not, a few of the team members were not on board. And they, they were the members who were really, really good at what they do. Like, you know, how some people are, they know their stuff well. And some people are in the learning stages where they're definitely looking for support. Mm -hmm. And what that is what we were trying to do um, for them to collaborate and have those sessions for knowledge share. I can I can kind of I'm I'm going to try to put myself into the the shoes of the people who were saying you know I feel like I'm giving but I'm not getting if they if if they've got a lot I can I can relate because if you've got a lot of experience on something and when I first started pairing it was rather frustrating sometimes to 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 try to step back and let somebody do things at their own pace and so uh, and and. Uh, one of the people I paired with, uh, Jim Shore, actually had the opposite with me, is that he's a very fast typist and he's a genius. So when he was working with me, he would often, it, it would almost felt like impatience, but he, he claims otherwise, but but he would grab the keyboard and go, ah, I see where you're going with this. Let me, let me, you know, so I barely contributed. But um, that, that, that's kind of a, a, a short-sighted view of things because if you are working with folks and you're not helping them level up, so to speak, you're not helping them understand the system that they're working on, uh, you're eventually going to end up having to do everything. You know, you're going to have to go back and fix their stuff. Well, nobody wants to go back and fix somebody else's stuff. It's not good for the person who, who may have made some kind of error or mistake or whatever, or just didn't design based on the idioms. Um, and it's not good for the the cowboy programmer to have to take on everything because that cowboy programmer can now no longer go on vacation ever. You know, they are the, the you don't want somebody to become the bottleneck. You don't want somebody, and it's, and it's usually like the cowboy programmer. That, that person becomes the person who is throttling the entire organization because if they get hurt, you know, we, one situation where one guy, the guy who knew how to do the thing broke his leg on a skiing trip right. and the entire team came to a complete halt. Right, like, right. Just done for. Yeah. So it's, it's kind of like uh, you got to get out of your head about this approach that I need to be the hero. I need to be the, uh, the expert on everything and be more like, okay, I need to be the mentor so that I can actually relax and enjoy doing some of the more uh, interesting things. And oftentimes it's, it, it, it's, it's kind of a, an interesting, you, here's, here's the thing. If you've got, the more challenging a, a task is, the more eyes you want on it. You know, you, you want more people to understand what's going on there and you want more input into what's going on. And sometimes I think software development teams get into this thing where they're, they're like, well, well, let's hand off the, the less important things to the, to the juniors. And I got to stop and ask at that point, what, what, why would you be working on anything that could be possibly be considered less important? You know, mm -hmm. if you're doing scrum, you're always working on the most important, most challenging stuff. You let the computer do the boring stuff. And so find a way to make the computer do the boring stuff and let everybody contribute. And uh, even if, you know, if, if you're a junior person, you, you're, you're going to learn to feel comfortable and kind of just absorbing. Got it. And, you know, and if you're a senior person, you also got to be able to just step back and, and uh, you know, I don't know, mentoring. have a drink, have, have a beer and mentoring and, <laughs> and chill, <laughs> you know, so. I, I, and, and I've seen it in myself and I've seen it in others. It, it is possible. It's not easy, but it is beneficial in the long term. It's beneficial to the organization. It's also beneficial to the individual to kind of let go of that. I need to be the hero kind of thing. Like I say, it's, it's so much easier to take a vacation when you're not coming back to a pile of stuff that everybody saved for you because you're the hero. That's so true. Yeah. I guess it has to do with the mindset, how they feel and, um, I don't know, superiority complex or whatever. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Changing the mindset is. Um, and yeah. keep in mind a, a superiority complex, having had one myself, a superiority complex is often uh, an imposter syndrome kind of thing. It's like, oh, 
how did I get myself into this situation? Do I really know what I know, what I think I know? Mm -hmm. And um, it's, it's actually, it, whether, whether or not you're right or not about that, uh, it comes out when you work with a team. You can, you can give yourself a little bit of opportunity to be humble about these things and you, you learn, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and tell the story. So I, I hired this guy who was two years out of college maybe and um, he had never done any of these things, test-driven development, pair programming, any of this kind of stuff. But in the hiring process, that's what they had to do. That was the, I was the technical uh, interviewer, right? So they would just sit with me and we would work on this little toy puzzle. And uh, he was by far the, the, the leader uh, in, in this kind of area. He, you know, he challenged me, even though he was so much younger, he's like, hey, no, you're wrong about that. And uh, kind of held me to task on stuff. And it was great, so we hired him. Um, and I, I'm, exp I'm sitting down with him the first day and explaining to him what we're working on. And we're working on this like six month project to, uh, to convert some code so that it, it issues its XML in a different format, blah, blah, blah. And he looks at me, this is 2003. And he looks at me and he says, why don't you just do an XSLT transformation? And I'm like, oh, well, because I don't know what the hell that is. I don't, I don't know what that is, what is that? So he trained, he taught me XSLT, which at the time was the hottest thing, you know, it, I'm sure it's obsolete now, but uh, at the time it was great. He taught me XSLT and what it could do and how we were gonna, and I figured out how to do that with Java. Java had a little object that would do the processing for us and how we could unit test it. So we actually unit tested our XSLT transformations. And between the two of us, we knocked that out instead of six weeks, six months, it was more like uh, four weeks. Mm, interesting. You know, is that, is that a return on investment? <laughs> so. Makes sense. Yeah. And I learned something. And if I had been like, no, I'm the, I'm, I'm the architect, I'm the XP coach. Yeah. See the mindset, right? Everyone has something to offer. Thank you, Rob. Appreciate Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Thank you. It, 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 these, it, it pains me to hear these, these situations where people are, are, are struggling because they... Yeah, it's just the practices are a little bit weird. Um, and there's, they're, they're definitely not easy and they're not always comfortable, but we also have to remember that we go to work to work. And, you know, if, if we can actually get behind this notion that these are the, these are the professional practices that have been shown, uh, in my experience, at least time and time again, to actually provide amazing return on investment, um, then you know, it's a no brainer. It makes it, if, if something is an amazing return on investment, then it's also so much easier for the software developer or whoever is working on the team to keep things sane, to, to be working in a sane environment. I'm noticing that we have uh, a bunch of chat questions. So hmm, let me see, I'm gonna look for question marks. Uh, there was a few notes. Mason did have a question at the end. He says, is there a way to have a small part of the team break off and try it as a proof of concept? Yeah. In fact, you know, when people hear mob programming, for example, they think everybody's got to be in the room. Um, most of the organizations that I know that mob, the mob is usually, um, it's, it's kind of more like an extended pair. It's like three to five people. And so they'll have multiple mobs working on multiple different things. And it's, I don't know how they decide. And sometimes they're just paired up. I don't know how they decide, but it's very organic. It's not like, okay, the entire team has to be watching all of this stuff. No, it's, it's um, let's put together the people who are uh, experienced in this code or they know about this technology. Hey, if you're doing AWS Lambda functions, I wanna have somebody who's familiar with AWS Lambda functions sitting next to me. Even if I think I know what I, I'm doing, I want to have somebody who knows their way around this stuff. Um, who's, you know, somebody from 
uh, product because we have questions. So a BA or the product owner can sit with us because we just have questions, you know, or even if it's just, hey, look at this cucumber scenario. Is this, are we on the right track or are we completely off track? And so, you know, it doesn't, it, there's, especially with mob programming, uh, Woody Zool will tell you there are no rules. It's, it, 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 it came about organically and it should stay organic. And th there have been, you know, attempts to apply rules and rules are good if, if things are getting chaotic, but, you know, effectively it's everybody's working towards a particular goal with a particular task. Well, if, if I may just jump in here with my second question, um, I seem to remember, because we've chatted a little bit, you and I before, um, isn't there something on GitHub that allows you to do asymmetrical pair or mob programming? Well, yeah, it um, it's called, if you just Google remote mob, remote mob programming, I think you end up at the GitHub repo for something called mob.sh, mob shell. And um, that actually is more designed towards having people remotely who are doing mobbing be able to switch the driver very quickly. So if I'm driving and then I'm done driving, I give a little mob shell command that says I'm done. And it basically pushes everything that I've done to a branch that then somebody else says, okay, I'm the driver and they pull everything from that branch. And the only reason why it's a branch and not the trunk is because you want to finish the task before you actually push to, to the trunk. So, yeah, so I think it keeps it on a, like a, a, a you know, a, a task specific branch. Yeah. The, the reason why I ask is I've got people for everywhere from Salt Lake city all the way to the Ukraine right? on one scrum team in right. theory, you know, I put scrum in the biggest quotation marks I can possibly put it. And, but yeah, oh, yeah. I, you know, it's, it's scrum in the academic sense. It might once have been an agile idea, but, mm. um, but yeah, so I, I'm trying to, and trying to get my, my development lead to sell to buy in on pair programming at all is a really hard sell because he's like, oh, well, we're each working on our own different interfaces. Uh, yeah, that's the problem. <laughs> Let me state the problem as a, a reason why we're not going to solve the problem. Um, yeah, if you're if you were working on your own product, that might be something interesting. But if you're working on your own quote unquote interfaces, so there's the. Now you mentioned kind of a, you know uh, working with multiple mobs. I suppose this would work. It's it, that's this is the thing that I think um, some of my uh, previous clients pre-pandemic were using during the pandemic. I, I'm not sure how you specify, you know, which, what, what branch you're on. Maybe you have to actually give it a branch name or something, or maybe it just randomly picks some kind of branch name, but there you go. Thank you, sir. Yeah. And that's there for everybody too. Very powerful stuff. Very simple. It's just a layer on top of Git. You know, it just simplifies the Git commands and for mob programmers. Uh, and I don't know what else is out there, but I see that 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 you know what they call the tool for Swift Git handover is the most active, very active. Um, so I'm gonna jump in. We're at 12:58 right now, so I know that there's gonna be people who are at the end on. of their time here. Um, but we'll keep the Zoom session open for anyone that wants to network. Um, we're, we're glad to have you stick around if you want, uh, but we'll, we'll cut the recording right now and, um, well, if I can figure out how to, but we'll, we'll transition over to, to kind of networking and open talking, whoever wants to stick around, but thank I'm you, Bob. That, I thought that was a great session. Um, we really you. appreciate it and, and appreciate having your expertise here.